In early 1942, the Soviet Union pushed the Allies to open another front in the West as the Germans closed in on Stalingrad. During the first months of the war, the British had engaged the Axis powers in North Africa, but they would have to cross the English Channel into Europe sooner or later. Thus, the Allied High Command chose Dieppe, a strategic coastal town in northern France, where the Germans had established a seafront defense with two imposing artillery batteries. Dieppe was within range of the Royal Air Force fighters, and on August 14th, the 174 Squadron, based at Manston Airfield in Kent, was moved to RAF Ford in West Sussex. Upon receiving the instructions, Flight Sergeant John William Brooks replied, quote, To Ford? For what? He and his unit would have the dubious honor of going into Dieppe first. Little did they know they were about to take part in what is widely considered to be the largest single day of air combat in World War II. Operational Level Codenamed Operation Jubilee, the amphibious assault on the German-occupied port of Dieppe in northern France was the first mission conducted jointly by the British and Commonwealth forces in the European theater during World War II. The idea was for the Allies to ease the pressure on Soviet forces under heavy attack on the Eastern Front. In addition, they could also test new equipment and the performance of nearby German facilities in the vicinity of Dieppe. But perhaps more importantly, the Western powers desperately needed to gain experience in amphibious assaults if they were to eventually defeat fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Although it was not planned as a full-scale assault in the fashion of D-Day, Operation Jubilee would be a consequential joint mission because all three services, the Navy, Army, and Air Force, had to plan and execute it in concert with each other. As such, the British plotted a raid for the summer of 1942 that included a large number of Canadian troops and a detachment of U.S. Rangers, amounting to roughly 6,000 men. The infantry would also be supported by 50 tanks as specialist commando units, as well as 250 Royal Navy assets at sea. The amphibious approach would also be covered by air support, provided by no less than a thousand aircraft from the Royal Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force. Notably, the mission would also see the participation of free French pilots who had joined the RAF after the fall of France. Yet, for all their efforts, the Allies would soon realize they were unprepared for such a daunting operational level of war, their first significant military operation on mainland Europe going back to Dunkirk in 1940. A Suitable Morning To capture the town of Dieppe, the Allied military would have to destroy local defenses, power stations, dock installations, and the aerodrome near the town. Additionally, they intended to remove German invasion barges in the harbor. The operation was to take place on the first suitable morning between August 16th and 23rd, sailing from the area of the Portsmouth Command. The landing would first try to seize the outer flanks of the town, six miles to the east and west of Dieppe, through the codenamed Orange and Yellow Beaches. Meanwhile, another force would secure Green Beach three miles to the west, and the Royal Regiment of Canada would secure Blue to the east, once the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, an Essex Scottish Regiment with the Camerons of Canada, had executed a frontal assault on Red and White just in front of Dieppe. After that, a Royal Marine Commando would land near the main harbor to demolish objectives while supported by tanks. The whole force would then withdraw for re-embarkation no later than 11 a.m. From the air, the fighters would provide general protection against air attacks during daylight, especially in the most vulnerable phases, such as landing and withdrawal. Additionally, close support, bombing, and low-flying fighter attacks would provide direct support, while smoke-laying aircraft were tasked with neutralizing defenses. Tactical and coastal reconnaissance sorties were also planned, as well as constant patrols to identify fighter anti-surface vessels. However, no preliminary nor diversionary efforts with bombers preceded the main assault, so as not to jeopardize the Allies' most important advantage, the element of surprise. Beads on a string. 
The Allies didn't know it, but the Germans were aware of the impending attack and prepared accordingly. However, by the time the Canadian and British forces reached the harbor, they were supported by the largest array of Royal Air Force aircraft seen by that point in the war, which did indeed take them by surprise. Leading the way was Air Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, the Air Force commanding of Fighter Command's 11 Group, with no less than 48 Spitfire, 8 Hurricane, 3 Typhoon, and 4 Mustang squadrons, as well as 7 Boston and Blenheim squadrons of 2 Group and Fighter Command. To put it in perspective, the aerial force at hand had more squadrons than those available to Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding at any time during the epic Battle of Britain. In the early hours of August 19th, Operation Jubilee was launched with a convoy steaming through the dark, but Number 3 Command was intercepted by enemy trawlers, thus crushing tactical surprise. Nevertheless, the initial naval forces arrived on time, and the aircraft of Bomber and Army Cooperation Commands began laying a smokescreen east of the harbor. Under this cover, intruder aircraft engaged the two gun batteries to the south of the town, pummeling the installations with bombs and machine gun fire as hurricane bombers, fighters, and spitfires attacked coastal emplacements and beach defenses. Meanwhile, cannon fighters provided direct support to the ground troops at the Red and White beaches. The enemy response was slow, but once it started, it was particularly destructive. Flight Sergeant John William Brooks of 174 Squadron recalled, quote, the light flak was coming up thick and fast, and we were flying at a very vulnerable height. I could see the 40 millimeter stuff curving up toward us, for all the world like a lot of bright glowing beads on a string. It would flash past us and explode just above our heads, or so it appeared. Flak always looks worse at night. A Souvenir As Sergeant Brooks closed into the coast, the area was suddenly visible. He recalled, quote, then I saw it. Three or four big splodges of German concrete surrounded by trees. I called up my section and told them target ahead. The sergeant then went down as low as he could and released his weapons. It was imperative that he didn't miss. Some small gun sights harassed him as he dived, and he fired back to force the enemies to keep their heads down. He then pulled out just as he saw the trees loom out of the darkness in front of him. His bombs had a six-second delay, while his men behind had two-second fuses. Brooks said, quote, After what seemed like a very long time, I saw the whole site go up in a series of quick flashes, and then felt the crump, which bounced my hurricane about. After refueling and having the aircraft patched up, the squadron went on a second sortie, now tasked with engaging a significant buildup of enemy tanks and artillery north of the town. Brooks recalled, quote, we went in to attack the tanks in two lines abreast as prearranged, and I could see the targets right ahead. They were slinging everything at us, or so it appeared. I flew straight at some transport and troops with guns going and skipped my bombs at them. I passed over the top at a couple of feet since I brought back with me a souvenir. It was the whip aerial off a German tank wedged in my radiator. Sergeant Brooke was awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal for his actions that day. Hindsight. While the landing party at Green Beach eventually succeeded, the assault on the eastern flank at Blue Beach failed. The casualties were mounting, and fuel and ammunition were scarce. Out of 17 pilots in Brooks's squadron, only eight made it back, while on the ground, over half the troops lost their lives or were wounded, and many more became prisoners. In addition, the Air Force lost about 10% of its strength. The Royal Air Force flew roughly 3,000 sorties during the Dieppe raid, while the Luftwaffe flew about 945. In addition, the Allies lost over 100 aircraft, while the Germans lost less than half of that number. The entire operation took place in 16 hours, and it ultimately was a terrible blow for the Allies, especially the Canadian forces. The naval and air support had proven insufficient, and the ground troops could not achieve their own objectives, as they were prevented from even entering the town. Furthermore, the withdrawal turned out to be more of a forced retreat, 
and Operation Jubilee would be remembered as a fiasco. Even so, both sides learned important lessons. As Lord Louis Mountbatten once expressed, quote, I have no doubt that the Battle of Normandy was won on the beaches of Dieppe. For every man who died in Dieppe, at least ten more must have been spared in Normandy in 1944. I'll go with that. Thank you for watching Dark Skies. Don't hesitate to hit the thumbs up icon and make sure to check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels for many more epic stories from the skies, seas, and lands of the world wars and beyond. Also, click on the bell icon to be notified of our newest content, which we publish regularly. And stay tuned.